Welcome everybody who's joining us. Thank you. It's really lovely to see ooh, so many people popping up. Um, I'm going to move the spotlight so we can see everybody on the screen. Um, it would be so lovely to know where everybody is because we are such um, a geographically spread crowd. So if you can jump into the chat on Zoom and just tell us where you are in the world as we're all entering. So jump into the chat and tell us where you're joining in from. There we go, lots of people arriving. Oh, hello, Greece. Hello, NYC. Oh my goodness, they're racing past me. Hello, East Anglia, Minneapolis, Bristol, Northumberland, Leeds, North London, Nottinghamshire, Covent Garden, Froome, Greenwich, Stroud, Greece, Battersea, Surrey, Baltimore, Northumberland. Um, uh, oh, they're racing fast, too part going past too fast now. Dubai, East Anglia, Bishop Auckland. <laughs> um, if you've just joined us, uh, do jump into the chat and just let us know where you are in the world. Um, it's really lovely to just see all the places zooming. Hello, Leeds and crew. Um, uh, maybe I'll see if I can put all of these on a map tomorrow and see where everyone joined us from. Um, fantastic. Hello everyone, it's absolutely lovely to see you all. I'm just giving another minute for people to join because um, there's lots of people flooding in. And uh, if you have just joined, everyone's been um, letting us know in the chat where they're joining us from. So just jump in the, in the chat and you can uh, let us know where you are in the world. Brilliant, hello Walton on Thames and Madrid and Cardiff. <laughs> Give me a bit of wonder last. I am in South London. I'm not in the live Canon office for those of you who are eagle-eyed, I am at home. Um, here we go, there's a few more people coming in. So if you haven't let yet, just jump in the chat and tell us where you are joining us from. It's amazing to, um, we've got quite a lot of continents covered there. Um, thank you so much everyone for being here. I'm just going to, uh, spotlight myself there we go um i'm helen and i'm the director of live canon um it's live canon's 15th birthday this year so uh going strong for 15 years and um we've been celebrating all year but the absolute highlight of live canon's year i think everybody agrees is our um anthology launch which is such a special occasion because the live canon international poetry competition is a really amazing way that we get to discover the work poets um, and build relationships with poets and there are so many um, amazing people that have come into live canon's life who i have first met through this competition so every time we uh, gather again uh, to celebrate it i feel like it will be the beginning of a whole set of new relationships with poets um, whose work we've had the opportunity to gallery. discover and indeed the uh, privilege to publish um, what's going to happen today in this launch is that we are going to hear uh, 20 of the poems which were shortlisted for the Live Canon Prize. All 50 of the poems that were longlisted appear in the anthology, and it is such an excess of riches in one anthology. And every year I say the anthology can't get any better, and every year it does, and um, we feel absolutely sort of overwhelmed and blessed to be in the company of those 50 poems, um, and uh, literally in the company, surrounded by the books and the envelopes and the jiffy bags and uh, everything else. Um, uh, but we're gonna hear the 20 poems that were shortlisted. Um, and then our very brilliant guest judge, Rebecca, is going to announce the winner. So just to be clear, nobody knows who's won. Um, and so any uh, surprise will be, be genuine, not feigned, um, uh, including, uh, you know, everyone from Live Canon, nobody knows who's won, um, uh, except me, uh, in the interest of full disclosure. But it is really, really um, exciting to get to be able to uh, genuinely announce the winner. So stand by for that happening um, at the end. Now, in terms of the actual poems, um, some of them are going to be read by the Live Canon Ensemble, um, and some of them are going to be read by the poets. And just to give some... Um, 
context to that. Uh, when we first founded Life Canon 15 years ago, the first bit of Life Canon that was founded was the Life Canon Ensemble, which is an ensemble of actors that specialize in performing poetry and verse for radio, for festivals. Um, uh, they get about a bit um, uh, working internationally and all over the place um, and uh, collaborate with poets and writers in all kinds of ways, uh, creating installations, performances, Lots of actors and poets have come together through this competition and other initiatives and have gone on to collaborate with each other. Um, so it's always been really amazing to create that sort of bridge, I suppose. Life Canon sits in a, in a strange and wonderful hinterland between theatre and um, verse text, and which is a very privileged place to find oneself, I find. Um, so right at this moment, uh, some of the Life Canon Ensemble are uh, on stage performing Lesia Krenke's, uh Ukrainian classic Cassandra down the road, which uh, we've been working on for the last few weeks. And some of the Lyra Canon Ensemble are here to read tonight's poems, and we're very, very grateful to them. But what used to happen in the pre-pandemic days is we used to do this in a, in a glorious theatre, and we would make the actors learn all 20 shortlisted poems, and they would come out on stage and perform them. Um, it was... <laughs> It was something of a, you know, a feat of, of uh, memory and brilliance um, uh, and uh, sheer terror. And, um, uh, but completely, I mean, there's nothing more terrifying, right, than performing a load of poems in front of the people who wrote them from memory in a big old barn of a theatre. Um, but post-pandemic, we've been holding this event uh, on Zoom. Partly because in the pandemic, um, the the poets and the audiences that we were building became much, much more global and much more international. So in terms of everyone being able to access this, we've kept it kept it on Zoom. Um, uh, but we might try next year to get it back into a real theatre. So stand by for uh, the learning onslaught to start uh, again, Ensemble. Um, but that's that's why that's the tradition really of it of it being a performance. Um, but today we gave people the option of having the actors read their poem or reading it themselves, and so um, it'll be a lovely mixed bag, which will keep it nice and fresh and change it up a bit on Zoom. So um, we're going to have a set of poems read by the actors, then a set read by the poets, then a set read by the actors, um, and then the uh, announcement. So. In a minute, I'm going to hand over, but we'll do a few little house rules first, which are, um, it'd be great if everyone could stay muted during the reading. I'll try and keep an eye on it as well and, and keep everybody muted. But if you can stay on mute, that would be absolutely great. Um, what we'll do is we'll have a batch of poems. And then at the end of the batch, I'll ask everyone to unmute and applaud. So we're, rather than applauding every poem, because then it'll be quite a long night. Uh, if you want, um, uh, need anything or having any problems at all, if you jump into the chat, you can send me a message um, directly or to everybody. And what's really nice is if you're enjoying the poems, because we aren't in a room and you can't beam at the poets and performers and, and give them your tangible love. Uh, what would be great is if you go into the chat and leave comments. Um, that's really nice. And it's a nice memento of the occasion. So feel free to um, to applaud with your words in, in the chat and uh, say if you are enjoying things, that'd be absolutely fabulous. Um, if you would like to watch this event back with captions, um, that will be available on Thursday morning. So if you email me, um, we can give you access to a completely captioned version of this. Um, we can't pre-caption it because we can't tell anybody who's won. Uh, but um, uh, but once the event has happened, we can we can make that available. So just send us a message. So uh, without further ado, we're going to launch into the first set of poems. This will be uh, a set of eight poems uh, from the anthology. They're going to be read by the very brilliant Eva, Nicole, Charlie and Leon. I'm going to hand over to them. We're going to listen to all eight and then we're going to rapturously applaud at the end of the eight. So over to Eva. The Last Books by Caroline Hammond. Sometimes, if there's no one else to raise her, books will take a girl and show her how to be. A world where swings hang in orchards, lady elocutionists take the stage and troubles can be met with fortitude. Lucy Maud Montgomery told me this the night we fixed the library. They'd hired me when the qualified staff refused to work nights after the breach in the corner set aside for children's lit. Stories leaked out of unput away books and came to life when the lights went out. 
bringing their boats and moats and midnight feasts till every inch of space was gone and those fearless daughters who wouldn't mix or share made war on each other while I watched, then tried to clean up once the mayhem died. Far worse were the nights of hoofbeats and roars when I was forced to hide under a desk. In fact, that's where the novelist found me. I didn't even try to not look sheepish, just nodded when she said, fetch the last books. You know the ones she means? The heroine grows up drably and makes a fitting end. And when these books were open on the desk, we saw them fully molded now, serene, mothers, teachers, wives, accomplished and wise. I listened to the hum of their voices as they pacified each animal and child till calm restored, they watched themselves play nicely for a while, then left me there, feeling like a girl with long red hair perched on a suitcase at a station, waiting to crack slates on careless heads. This poem is by Natalie Scott. A is for apple, not Adam, said Eve, her plump fingers reaching out for the bare red skin of it, blushing corruption. Like the whole world, she wanted to hold it in her hands to alleviate the tedium of him and his rules and reason printed on a t-shirt made in God's image, XXXL. She had her own shape, wide at the hips, like a ripening pear. From its pips, the apple called to her, to her fruitier side. It promised a juicier future. She salivated as thoughts of puncturing its waxy skin with her incisors fluttered in her mind. Adam tut-tutted and talked about procreation. Eve wanted emotional and sexual liberation. A is for apple. She held it in her palms like a final written warning. Then sunk her teeth in right to the core. Because Simon by Dominic Weston. I will squat outside the door of Victoria Wine until well after closing time to try and slip a package through its tight lipped letterbox. Because I am that man who buys too much Chilean Merlot from you and spends too long in your shop buying it because, Simon, I don't know how to talk to you. We only know each other from the shop, it's true. I'm drinking too much Merlot now, it's true. The Diet Coke I buy is for my flatmates, not me, also true. I will discover that the letterbox is a little too narrow for my intentions <laughs> and make more than one trip back to the flat to strip them down because I am that man who puts too much emphasis on these things and creates elaborate distractions. Because, Simon, I don't know how to talk to you. <laughs> You're not desperate enough to go to the Oasis like I do. You don't climb the narrow stairs to Club 49 like I do. You don't even go to the gaily vague watershed like I do. I will worry that the police will notice me on my hands and knees and ask what's in the package hanging on a wire on the other side, because I am a man who finds significance in manufactured symbols and has made you this anonymized Valentine. Because, Simon, I don't know how to talk to you. I have cried to Dusty Springfield in Sainsbury's for you. I have stolen craft materials from an independent shop for you. I have planned a wedding, even though it's not yet legal, for you. I will wait 
for a sign now. I will probably wait for a very long time now. And it's pathetic. It, it's heroic or well, somewhere in between. Because in six hours or so, you'll open up and won't even know it's from me and write it off as a lame attempt from your ex because, Simon, he didn't know how to talk to you. White Flag by Mark Fidesz. It was hardly the offensive we expected. A few marigolds had their necks broken. Roses that petalled late were detonated at a safe distance under a hail of conkers. This morning, swifts wheel homewards on brand new air that has been chilled above container seaports west of here. Still reckless and loose with summer, we go through the usual commotions that fill our kitchen with vapours. The holy ghost of slightly burned toast. An old kettle heaves, stove eggs rattle. We sup tea's humble beatitudes. Somehow the heating has turned itself on, waking flies and a thump in the roof. The radio flips from Elgar to news of war. Reporters call it a strategic withdrawal. Beefy generals who left their guns behind in the rush quote Aristotle and Sun Tzu. More butter, please, and sweet preserves prickled from our hedgerows and hearts. A child's blackberry drawn on the label and the sticky plates we will never replace because these are our chipped histories. This is how we start delicate negotiations with the swallow envoys of winter. For we are the meek and the peacemakers. Ours is the sourdough of heaven. This poem is written in the Ashling form and was inspired by sketches in the West of Ireland, an article and illustrations by James Mahoney, published in the Illustrated London News during the Great Irish Famine on the 13th of February, 1847. Ashling by Anne Casey. And still this life parts your lids. You see, you seeing, your extending hand as a falling wave. Claudia Rankin, some years there exists a wanting to escape. Eyes wide, blazing hazel against the wild ochre flame of your hair. A falling wave, ebbing of your rebel airs the rising tide of your keening as your fields filled with the black and fetid, the bloodied knuckles of desperate mothers reaping pestilence from frozen muck to feed their wailing children, no crow to shriek from barren trees. A scattering of blackbirds now raking broken earth, tut tut at the ramshackle cart, a grating lullaby rising from its overburdened axles as it trundles you towards the waiting wound, your arm still extended around your infant son, bundled with a hundred twig-like others, today's bitter harvest to be planted with the rest. This is The Experiments by Isabella Mead. Somewhere in a lab on the coast, scientists are ogling an aquarium, breath misting the glass of their saltwater nursery through barnacles, sea urchins and anemones, where fishing lines sway slowly 
dangling Lego bricks at their tip, ribboned and suspended like gifts, bright and defiant and out of context, like pixels on screen or boiled sweets. The experiment to reseed an entire coral reef, brick by brick, for fragile polyps to embed into blocks of red and green. And this is valid. This is enough. That unclipped and set in the ocean, tentacles will stretch and flourish, unfurl a glorious fluorescent ecosystem of limpid oranges and reds and pinks, burgeoning and vivid and affirmative, replenishing the half-hearted wavering of its shrunken former self, the ghostly pale bleaching and retreat. As the womb feels on dragging days, when dull tendrils clutch at nothing, stirring and rising and shrugging inside the figure sat staring at a Petri dish. The experiment for two disparate sediments to swim micro droplets and mineral oil and interlock and form a tiny soul to flourish and fast forward to a softly lit playroom where Lego pieces lie on the floor abandoned after hours of being ro robots and flowers and cars. And this too is valid, this is enough. That veins are running with a red brick blush, diminishing the transparency of water and glass. Poem for Frank O'Hara by Anthony Mayer. Frank, that buggy on Fire Island came hurtling from the dark as fast as a hoodlum's fist. No time to be scared, the dance bar music still in your ears. And perhaps as you wait for the cab they called, you're thinking of a poem with Chinese fortune tellers in, storks and garbage men and saxophones. Or perhaps that blonde guy in the bar who gave you the eye. Help me bring excitement into this poem like a juggler, say, a dancing elephant, or even you, crashing through my double glazing this summer night and asking for a cocktail, a Manhattan or Negroni before you take me in your arms like you took that blonde guy and carry on as if the buggy had been a passing seagull or a dog that cocked its leg rather than a bolt of lightning aimed at you by some malicious god. But would your visit be followed by a life of bliss in your apartment? Or would you pat my cheek in your usual charming way, then leave to join the waiting cab and the friends I'd never meet, the night breeze ruffling your shirt without seeing the buggy that will put an end to all of this, the parrots, jujubes and the waving palms. Blueprint for Living by Steve Zeri. Welcome to your new home, bespoke apartment on the bottommost floor of a self-threading helix plunged deep into the land, engineered to withstand burial among clustered depth scrapers, all vertical corridors and tubes to carry cables and vacuum powered lifts. Condensate traps return breathed moisture to the taps, our exhaled gases, cooled and chemically scrubbed, are dispersed in endless cycles through ceiling vents. You will not miss the sky. 
We thrill these days to branching roots, as once we loved the mirrored crowns of birch and elm trees spread against the blue. We were always adaptable, and now our children make pets of velvet worms and sweetly myopic moles. But that's not the end of it. Our waving fingertips have begun to grow bioluminescent patches, which serve as torches, while our evolving eyes shine like those of cats in the low light. Far below Terra's curdled atmosphere, new world and new body promise undreamt of pleasures. Loosing skin from muscle, muscle from bone, we shuck the shackled flesh, unleash the immaterial force field we enclose to swim out in fluid earth, released from circadian solar rhythm, to watch the tardigrades flock in murmuration. <clears throat> Thank you so much, E4, for, for those eight brilliant poems. And let's have an enormous round of applause for the eight poets. Here we go. <laughs> Um, there's eight absolutely extraordinary poems there, and uh, people are popping their uh, comments in in the chat, full of uh, full of compliments. So poets, please please dive in there, um, and, and bask in the glory. Uh, but um, uh, it's amazing to just get a glimpse of of all the extraordinary things uh, in the anthology. And um, I've read all of those poems many many times, but it's really lovely to hear them absolutely leap off the page. So uh, thank you very much to. You. Um, Leon, Charlie, Nicole, and Eva. Um, carrying on, uh, changing things up now, we're now going to hear um, the next um, uh, six poems uh, from the poets, and um, uh, we'll um, give them all a bit of a round of applause at the end of each as we change over. So first of all, I'm going to um, invite Leslie Sharp to read. Thanks, Helen. Uh, so this poem is called Labyrinth. The truth is, that constancy of a sort is an unescapable virtue, for the things that the heart is seeking, if they are multiple at all, are very few. They are found and lost many times over with changing names. Freya Stark. Take my hand. The path will not lead us there directly, but enter in. Unfold your sorrow until it is a spool of thread, a trail behind you, which you will not need when you reach the centre. The way back is straight and easy, coming out of the heat of things. But you may not wish to leave. Who knows how many times we will enter, follow, find, feel the curve of footpath, footfall, flesh, of thought that loops back on itself, journeys forth, a dance, a dance, a dance aiming for nowhere in particular, finding itself suddenly, entering the pulse of earth that answers back, says here, here, here. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, and over to Matt Hona who I think is here all the way from the States. A trumpeter in Sumi plays the Ukrainian national anthem during the Russian invasion. While in Baltimore, we hold a bake sale. At St. Michael, the Archangel Ukrainian Catholic Church, they are selling pierogies to raise money for their homeland, not because in a city nicknamed Mob Town, we don't know the recipe for Molotov cocktails or how to lob them at the vehicles of occupying forces. Not because in a city nicknamed Bodymore Murderland, we don't know how to kill fellow human beings in close anger with frequent efficiency or because we don't know how to write new anthems for young nations while being bombed by a despot trying to erase us from the language of maps. But because sometimes we vogue to Michael Jackson in front of armored police vehicles manned by uniforms from hostile neighboring counties. 
because an old woman in Ukraine walks up to a Russian soldier offering seeds to fill his pockets so that sunflowers will grow where he falls. Because here, sometimes, a black man sees a white man struggling to pull 500 pounds of mulch to the register at the Home Depot and gives him a push without exchanging names past thank you, a handshake, a smile. Because we embrace the grace and dignity of freedom exercised in the lunacy of dancing in front of a line of guns held by men who would rather kill us than know us. That it's easier to make the everyday heaviness of life collective than to watch one person struggle with it. That even battlefields will bloom again where the dead lay now. That small savory pastries can soothe hearts grieving for the old country. Because every mother who has buried a son killed by violence knows that ache. Because we know that sometimes in the middle of rocket fire bombardment from a dying empire, the best thing you can do is write a poem. Thank you so much. Um, and for that brilliant reading, it was a real pleasure to get to hear that. Um, and next uh, is Helen Kay. Bitter from the Old English, biter. The fox took away my old hens last night to feed its starving cubs. Its vampire teeth parted feathers pierced the esophagus and windpipe below the sinewy neck and severed the spinal core. Quick as birds that snatch worms or pluck a butterfly off a shelf of air. No waste, no signs, bar sequins of spilt corn on malted feathers. Wearing his wife's kimono, a QC beat to death a fox caught in the wire fence round his hen coop, blooded his baseball bat. I am not bitter, Foxy. The cruelest bite is the empty plate of death. <clears throat> I would bequeath you my thighs, breast and legs to plump up your bony kin. Worse things lurk darkly. Two million hens gassed and eaten daily. We will chainsaw the coop, splintering tears of plywood on the earth. We will plant egg smooth bean seeds in our hen manure and watch the sparrow steal red cherries. I will stir my tears into a glass of wine or let them fall to dry on a page of words. I will wear my fox socks, post hashtag fox pics, cross my fingers, bolt my door at dusk. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, absolutely gorgeous poem uh, and brilliantly read, thank you. Um, and next we have Martin Crucifix. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, this poem is called As With Sickness. A breeze blows up as the pressure drops, and there's something wrong with the steps ahead. Though a jaunty tub of scarlet geraniums wriggles its flowers to and fro. But start from the top, where a few begin, and all the treads and risers appear level and steady. Though if you start from down below, you'll face instead this lopsided grin, this prospect of roughened stones, tipped and tilting, beneath dressed slabs rising straight and apparently true, yet splashed with lichen, as with sickness, yellow and white, or is it nothing more than paint daubed and spilled by some previous child? But step if you dare, 
and halfway down the right sides faulted if you set out from the top, though if you started from below you'll catch a glimpse of ceiling cement on the left, dabbed here and there, where warped treads seem affected by frost or summer rain, though perhaps every riser rakes left as much as right to make balance hard. Yet some fleeting grace in having come so far, or is it the breeze, suggests looking back, your feet at the summit from where you return to the garden, if you set out from above, then back to where a tub of scarlet geraniums has spilled its petals on the ground. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, the next poem is by Laurie Bolger and it's been sent to me um, as a video because they are uh, teaching a workshop at this exact moment. So I'm going to share it with you and hopefully do this smoothly and effortlessly. Here we go. George, after Morgan Parker. George loves pizza. George stroked a tiger. George likes his girls girly and will tell you that he's tall. George isn't looking for anything serious. George knows this amazing little place by the river. George had his bum out on a cliff once. George, if you like cheese, then you'll love him. George is a cheeky chappy. George likes his women funny. George usually goes for blondes, but George has this thing for brunettes. George will kiss you on the forehead and make sure you get home safe. George doesn't pay rent. George got played on BBC Radio 6 at four in the morning. George says, fair play. George says his ex was a model. George loves curves. George calls you his sweet vanilla latte. George's best friend is Nick from the microbrewery. George paid someone to put together his eco-friendly urban wall garden that has a diesel engine. George beckons over the waitress. George calls her honey. George tips her 20 and makes sure you see it. George calls the bouncer buddy. George keeps saying, nice guy. George calls his mummy and you know that she won't like you. George's ex sold ice cream from a wheelbarrow. George's ex dressed up like a schoolgirl. George thinks it's really sexy when girls read. George calls the place you were born in a little bit of a shithole. George has so much money. You'd like to take George's money and buy him some socks. George gets cross when they're out of arm and croissants because he bang ahead and has cycled all the way from Putney. George drives you crazy when you don't hear from him in three weeks, even though the last time you did, he drunk dialed you from the Chinese restaurant on the Strand and told you that he thought he might love you. George might be dead. George keeps the book of plays you gave him next to his bed. George has this little gold pen with his initials on. George gets back in touch. George insists you meet his parents. George dresses you up in his stepmom's barber coat and hat and calls you a cutie. George's dad taps your bum at the bar like it's 1950. George says you can really pull that look off. That is just his dad's way. Thank you so much to Laurie for that. Um, and I, I hope they're going to be able to pop in uh, to this at some point, but they were busy teaching. And over to Tamsin Hopkins. I've lost Tamsin. Where's Tamsin? Yeah. Oh, there you are. I found you. <laughs> There's lots of people. <laughs> Wolf sister running. She would not come away with me. I tried everything, lit a fire, told the stories. I thought she softened when I spoke of our home, trees tall in our girlhood. I see we're both in snow now. I'd searched frozen tundra by sled, my voice a raw thing calling. A white mirror, the land rejected me. I stopped at any reflection, dismounted at the slightest shadow, dragging my legs through deep snow. I searched, excavated every hollow, every frozen leafless twig. By chance, I discovered her spore. In a small clearing, sunlight had found her, rock and ice her only protection. 
my throat filled, flaked with white. At my voice, eyes slid away. Her head was still fine, skin a tight covering, but her body, her feet were transparent. I whispered all her names, love, baby, pet, sister, darling. She recognized me. I could not get close. The journey back, a hurry of breath, every husky in the team, a running intention. I couldn't give her up nor could I keep her. For a time, I was lost. Daily, I twisted a braid from hair I took, the same colour as my own, whispered songs to it. The glass blower knew what to do. She burned the last of my sister's hair. Ash melted. My girl became crystal. Wolf, not lost. She, we, always running cold together. Her claws marking tracks on ice. The length of my mantelpiece. A glassy snout, a running front paw hovering as if on snow. Thank you so much, Tamsin. And uh, thank you to all six poets who have just read. So let's have a rather thunderous, crackly, zoomy round of applause. Um, thank you. Um, we've heard extraordinary poems uh, so far. Um, but I just wanted to take a moment before we carry on because in the anthology, there are 50, um, we're only getting to hear 20 poems tonight, but there are 50 brilliant poems by an extraordinary um, uh, array of poets. Um, and I want to take a moment to thank all of them. So here's how we're gonna do it. I'm gonna read all 50 names of the poets in the anthology and you are going to all keep the applause going. Uh, we won't be able to hear it because we're on Zoom, but I'll be able to see it because I'm going to remove, there we go, and I can see you all on gallery. So you've got to keep clapping while I read the names of all 50 poets in the anthology, and I can see you all. So keep those hands going. Here we go. In the 2022 anthology, we have, with massive thanks, Katie Griffiths, Barrow, Glenn Wilson, Adrian Bruckner, Anthony Mayer, Tessa Foley, Jacqueline Schalger, Jenny Mitchell, Sarah Westcott, Vanessa Lampert, Erica Jane Morris, Nora Nadjarian, Rod Whitworth, Kathy Pimlot, Sarah Diamond, Henry St. Ledger, Jonathan Greenhouse, Laura Thais, Dylan Jacks, Emma Simon, Laurie Bolger, Paul Stevenson, Arjunan Manuel Palai, Charlotte Ansel, Sana Rao, Leslie Sharp, Dice Laney, Charles Penty, Natalie Scott, Matt Horner, Jill Abram, Anne Casey, Deborah Finding, Katrina Campbell, Martin Crucifix, Dominic Weston, Helen Kay, Steve Seri, NJ Hines, Ilsa Pedler, Isabel Mead, William Lancaster, Caroline Hammond, Jane Byrne, Chrissy Banks, Cy Forrest, Alison Binney, Hilary Watson, Josephine Corcoran, Mark Fiddes, Tamsin Hopkins, Jules Sparks, and an apology on the end to John Lancaster, whose name I just got wrong as William Lancaster, I'm so sorry. Uh, keep the applause going. That's all 50 of the extraordinary poets who appear in the 2022 anthology. Um, and I just can't wait for people to uh, start reading it and uh, start feeding back to us um, because uh, I know you're gonna absolutely, absolutely love it. It's an extraordinary anthology and we're ridiculously privileged to be able to represent all 50 of those poets. Um, so now we have another treat, which is six more poems uh, to listen to. And I'm gonna hand back to Eva, Leon, Charlie and Nicole to read them for you too. So um, over to Nicole. This poem is by Jane Byrne. The mother bear told her cub that it was okay to be afraid. Anyone seeing the ocean for the first time is bound to feel a little overwhelmed. So deep so damp, so gray, so blue. Their bare feet test the smallest waves. How quickly each print is swallowed by the sand. 
Mother Bear told her cub all that she knew about trees. Some proverb about acorns becoming mighty oaks. How sweet the freshly fallen taste. How the copper swell of a ripe nut beams from the split in its spiny shell. How they are hidden against hard times they worried through drifts of leaves. Took the best ones home. Rubbed each leaf with crayon and pinned the wall with paper ghosts. Mother Bear made a story for each bird that came to the table to eat. How the robin got its red breast. How sparrows are really wishes in disguise. Go on, my darling, try. The window became a page. The picture changing somehow every day. Mother Bear told her cub about rain. They watched the pathway fill with tiny seas, splashed and laughed, watched their faces bloom, the pools below as rivers carved a wet way through their shining pelts. Mother Bear held her cub's paw, palm to sweet and fragile palm, in the middle of their grip, a church of air warm and filled with scents. Mother Bear said, what was kept so tight between their hands would be released like a butterfly, brought to life inside this touching of their skins. A mite of air, the shape of wings, swallowed by the larger sky living on as molecules of breeze and breath. See that cloud? Well, that will be. Mother Bear watched each season wither its own way past, learn the shapes of winter. How snow is just another word for cold, for something lying quietly over everything she knows. Celestial by N.J. Hines. People's minds need to wander. Yinka Shonibari. His new helmet is a bubble filled with sun. He chose it because it's lighter than any he's worn before. Gloriously warm, it frees his neck and gives nothing away, this one. No change in colour to signal a shift in mood or return to preset grey, just silence and the blue of a cloudless day, more intense than feel-good pills, plus the euphoria's true. So why, his brother asks, become the sky? Why invite others to look through him? Where's his pride? The words beat a hymn inside his head, slowing his regular stride, but the blue persists beyond all skin. He is the sky and the sky holds everything. The Half a Crown by John Lancaster. The news delivers the dead like cricket scores, deadpan. And with no God jumping off a cloud to help or guess a future, today I crave past truths to ease the dead. I'm coop flown to the hanging gate, musing and joshing on whatever happened to Pamela Machen. When Frank pronounces, all memories grow into childhood. And right then, unbottled this pouring out of a gone world. How Hezekiah Bailey 
who wouldn't let a tractor on his land, had found a fortnight of weather when he tapped a rising glass and the wireless gave no rain to begin his scything. And till the mowing done, slept under a hedge bedded in hessian hen corn snacks. Slept under a hedge bedded in hessian hen corn sacks. Dropping off to night jars, whirring in the wood, of how he fed from linen bundles and jugs of nettle beer his children brought. Then, when his sharpening whetstone clank had frit the larks and peewits, marked their nests with hawthorn sticks to save them from his blade. Of how he would send the village folk a call for help with the scorching hay after his wife had lit an apron full to show it ready. And we came, shoving two oak poles called stangs under each hubbled ruck, carted them sedan chair-like to the barn where he'd pikele the piles up through the pitching hole till dusk. Then face to face gave me and Frank and Pamela his thanks and half a crown, his fairness and the coins cupped gently like newfound eggs, walked slowly home to share. Now that needed fragment of sense to share before being curfewed back to the pen. And here we are. And what the hell are we going to do about it? This is BBC One, now the nine o'clock news by Hilary Watson. Snowy the rabbit is worried about the fox staring at her, licking his lips in the night. So I need daddy to read the next chapter so Paddy can tell Sophie to do with what to do with the sack. I wish the man could stop talking. Peter Sisson says children have lost their homes in Kosovo. Sarah and Kirsty have two horses. Their Bampy has racer puppies in a cage in his garden. Auntie Chrissy talks about her older husband, talks about sex. I laugh like everyone, but she looks at me in the mirror in the car and says, sometimes adults do talk about sex, you know. Her friend smells like tobacco. He throws his quavers pack out the window. Acha V. We learned that in Welsh. And my hin buruglau. And Guy fun dirty bachos da to go to the toilet because Mrs. Evans always says yes to that, but in English she says no. She says, why didn't you go at playtime? The box of rope smells akavi. I like making bubbles with soap. The hot tap doesn't work. The paper towels smell blue. I drew a picture of St. Lucia, which is an island, and I got a pen pal called Clara in Prague, which isn't in Czechoslovakia. I don't know where Kosovo is, and no one gave me an address for any girls there. When I'm bigger, I could go and maybe recognize the girls and boys from off TV. The news is always on. On weekends, it's even later. If daddy read to me instead, we'd have done the scary bit and found the pot of gold. This poem is called Visiting Woodhenge and the Church of St. Mary and St. Malore, Amesbury, by Josephine Kakorin. It is the story of a woman whose understanding travels dreamlike between two places. One scorching day, she adds her fingerprints to a stone and timber Neolithic circle to an early church. Time, a dandelion clock. Knowing, unknowing, she steps on footprints, belongings, bones, returning and returning to a mound of flint, small inhumation, flowers and grasses, 
shaped like circles, little offerings. Mary's robes, blue as cloudlessness, upright baby in her arms, cool stone walls, forgive the heat wave, rows of shining candles. She has read poems, heard mother cow outside a slaughterhouse, cried in cinemas, scenes of small unslept in beds. In newspapers, history books, read of disappearances, violence, children owned, bartered, sacrificed, stored all this, her heart, an aching place, plot of ancient pain, where coins are thrown for luck and children make daisy chains, singing wishes while parents hold up their phones like lanterns. No holy water in the font, but Josophila. She dips her hand in baby's breath, also known as maiden's breath, closes her eyes in sunlight, as if she is half waking. The Women of Ten by Three by Alison Binney. Getting you out of hospital is the latest thing I think I should know how to do and don't. But I have Donna's number on a post-it. I'm not sure who Donna is, but when she picks up and calls me darling, I nearly cry. You're not her remit anymore. Donna says, but she hands me over to Holly, who calls Amber from Respite Care. Holly will get you transferred this afternoon, and once you're settled, Keely and Kaylee will be in touch. And now we have a plan. And I know it will be okay, because we both trust these women with the names of girls who sat at the backs of our classrooms years ago, you about to retire, me just starting out. The ones who'd warn us when a lad farted, who'd cared enough to chew without us seeing, the ones who'd lend a highlighter and print coursework in 14 point with bordered hearts. Sometimes they'd be off and we'd find out there was a brother with downs or a nan who wanted company. And it would make sense then, that point they'd made about Juliet and the nurse, when we'd picked on them one Friday afternoon and realized there was more going on. They're tattooed now, often, which you enjoy, though you'd never have brooked it on me. It's something to chat over while they're helping you on with your socks, the hearts filled with children's names the no good men morphed into dolphins. They make it all look as easy as you once made poems seem or tried to. These impressive, capable ambers and dawns who've learned to read between your lines, to breathe warmth into the hard words. And now Holly with the mermaid tattoo coming down the ward with her clipboard, who will sign your discharge papers with a circle over the eye. Then follow me out to ask if you'd like a man to change your pad. Thank you so much, Eva. Um, and that was the last of our poems. So let's all unmute for a second and we can give a nice Crackly. Thank you so much, and thank you, Ava, Ava, Molly, and Nicole, um, uh, for reading those, and thank you to the six brilliant poets for 
privilege of us getting to to hear those poems. And um, so somebody just commented in the chat. I wouldn't like to have to judge this competition because um, uh, what an extraordinary um, selection of poems we've heard over the last uh, hour. Um, what a range, um, how much humanity um, and, uh, but somebody had to do it. Um, and um, we were absolutely honored uh, this year to have um, uh, Rebecca Goss as our guest judge. I've been a big fan of her work. I persuaded her to come and uh, read in the Life Canon reading series um, uh, recently and then got brave and asked if uh, she would then uh, judge our competition and join the list of the many wonderful poets that we've had the privilege of involving in this endeavor. Um, and if you're not familiar with Rebecca's work, I'm going to put a, a link in the chat in a moment so you can go away and explore it. Um, and also in particular, I'm going to put a link to uh, one of my favorite things, which is Rebecca's um, uh, page on the Poetry Archive, where you get to hear her work out loud, as we've just heard so many poems uh, just now, it's a real treat. And uh, if you, um, uh, when this ends and the Zoom call goes and you press the red button and feel a bit bereft, uh, that's what I suggest you do to continue your poetry evening. So I'm gonna share that link with you in just a second. And now I'm gonna hand over to Rebecca. Oh, thank you, Helen. You're so lovely and you're so, so good on your feet at these things um, and you make everyone feel so welcome. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I am just juggling my camera because you can't. You're not allowed to see all the chaos that is that way. But I just want to say um, I, I someone said they felt a bit emotional and I do feel a bit teary eyed having listened to to all those poems that have um, I obviously feel I know quite well, having read them lots and lots of times. And um, I just want to congratulate absolutely everybody on um, you know, writing the work and thank you for sending it to me. And um, and you should all feel extremely proud of yourself um, uh, to see your work now in print in, in that wonderful anthology. Um, but it's been so great to hear them. I've really loved that, to hear them spoken um, by both the actors and the poets themselves. And I've really enjoyed the chat. I'm rubbish at Zoom on the chat, I'm terrible. Uh, I'm not very good at keeping up, but I've loved the chat. And I've also, I've really liked sort of reading and thinking, yeah, I was right about that one. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> because it is a really lonely business, this judging thing, sitting, sitting in your room and, um, you know, sort of living with and getting to know these poems, but not, but you don't talk to anybody else about it, of course, you just think about it for a long time, and carry them with you. I really did enjoy the judging process though. And one thing I wanted to mention is I read them all during the heat wave. I really remember <laughs> judging them. It was very, very hot, but I was reading poems with lots and lots of cold things in. There just happened to be a lot of cold stuff. So there was a lot of snow, a lot of wolves and foxes and bears, and it really cooled me down and I really liked that. And, and my favorite wolves and bears and foxes made it through to this evening. It was nice to see them. Um, <clears throat> uh, so thank you for that. So yeah, just again, congratulations. I am a big waffler. Anyone who comes to my readings know that I waffle a lot. So I am gonna cut to the chase, but I do uh, just once again, want to say um, thank you to everyone for sending poems for me. Congratulations again and great. Um, that you're going to be in the anthology and lovely that so many are here this evening. Um, so there were two poems that stayed quite close to the to the top. I don't know. I hate saying first prize because somebody's right. You are all winners. But yeah. So and and I anyway. So I have a highly commended and I have a win. And the highly commended poem. And it's interesting because I think they're very different poems, but they stayed very close <laughs> together and with me all the way through very different but anyway the second prize and um, the, the highly commended um poem goes to matt hona and i hope i have pronounced that right for that wonderful title and i am going to say it in full because i do like a long title a trumpeter in sumi plays the ukrainian national anthem during the russian invasion while in baltimore we hold a bake sale so um huge congratulations to matt for that i um can't quite there are so many faces in front of me i'm trying to find you but um I just wanted to say how I felt it was a really important poem and a very strong and impassioned poem, but also, but I like the amount of, uh, that you got so much information into it, weaving the personal with the political really seamlessly, but also in, in it was all packed into those really sort of tight, those long but tight 
couplets. You know, you took us to multiple places with multiple images. And how do you do a very, very big thing, like write about war when you're maybe not experiencing it yourself, but I think you were able to take us right in there to something that felt a, a very real experience. So I, I want to thank you for that, Matt. And, um, and of course, the war, when I was reading these poems, the war was very much at the forefront on the news. And then of course, all this time later, it still is. So um, it's a very important poem for now, I think. Thank you. Um, and I believe you have a poetry collection coming out next year, Matt, with Salmon Poetry. So um, there you go, I've given that little plug. But, um, but uh, I'm, I look forward to reading that myself. So congratulations to you, Matt. And the winner, uh, for me, and it was really, really hard choosing. But um, I chose this poem because the first time I read it, and then each time I went back to it, I fell in love with it again for its very, very tender address. That's the thing that really stood out. And the winner tonight is Anthony Mayer for his poem, Poem for Frank O'Hara. And um, so congratulations and I, I want to say it again so a very very different poem yes well done Anthony a very different poem but again a poem that took us to lots of different places and there's something that wanted me to sort I wanted to sort of draw attention to the decept deceptively simple poem really that um it, but it's 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 all written for those of you who can't see it it's all one stanza there's no full stop it's one of those kind of what I call one breath poems you just keep going um but it took us to all these different places and we in and out of the narrator's head the speaker's head and Frank's life and I loved the way um it, it just felt heady um and it was lovely to read um that mix of sort of real life and fantasy and um, but I felt very transported in every line. There was such an, a lovely image in every in, in every single line, and um, there was a sadness and a joy working at the same time all the way through. And I thought I really admired that. And but what I also particularly liked is that it, it was a poem about our our love for writers our love for other poets you know and um and that maybe we would all love them to come crashing through our double glazing one night and come and talk to us and and i i loved it for that it made me think of the love that we carry for writers and that of course is one of the reason we're all writers and um but it was it was very very touching and i just read i don't know if you know anthony andrew sean greer's work i really love his I, really love his novels and I just finished less um and then I read your poem and I just I don't know I just I was in that kind of zone <laughs> but it really it, it, I just felt that similar sort of tenderness a real warmth to the people I found in poem for Frank O'Hara so huge congratulations to you and to everybody here and I've really 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 enjoyed the evening thank you very much for having me oh you're still muted Helen Thank you so much, Rebecca. And um, Anthony, I'm just warning you, I'm about to pull you onto the screen. So make sure you're decent. Um, and uh, I'm going to pop you on the screen so we can all applaud you thunderously. Are you ready? Here we go. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm completely overwhelmed by this because it's the last thing I was expecting. I've been going through a very dry patch poetry wise uh, recently. And uh, well, I just I can hardly believe it. I'm weeping. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, really sorry. I'm equally quite delighted to make you cry, Anthony. And um, uh, I think all of us would now love to hear that poem again. So I'm going to give you a choice, Anthony. Would you like to read it? or Would you like me to ask Leon to do the honours? Uh, get Leon, because I haven't got the text in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reason. So, um, uh, thank you so much, Rebecca, for judging with such um, uh, attentiveness and attention and care and joy and love for all of those poems. Um, I felt they were in such extraordinary hands when I sent them to you. Um, and uh, thank you so much for, for speaking so eloquently about that process as well um, and of course uh, I love all the poems in the anthology that goes without saying and uh, they're all going to be enjoyed um, and shared 
Uh, you have to have a winner of a poetry competition because that's how they work, right? But um, uh, it really is true to say that there's so much that's wonderful in this anthology. So thank you to everyone for being here. I'm going to hand over to Leon. He's going to read that poem again. And then we're going to toast the anthology into its existence and set it free into the world. So over to you, Leon, uh, if you're standing by as well, ready to be dragged onto the screen. Here we go. This is Poem for Frank O'Hara by Anthony Mayer. Frank, that buggy on Fire Island came hurtling from the dark as fast as a hoodlum's fist. No time to be scared. The dance bar music still in your ears. And perhaps as you wait for the cab they called, you're thinking of a poem with Chinese fortune tellers in, storks and garbage men, and saxophones. Or perhaps that blonde guy in the bar who gave you the eye. Help me bring excitement into this poem like a juggler stay a dancing elephant or even you crashing through my double glazing this summer night and asking for a cocktail a manhattan or negroni before you take me in your arms like you took that blonde guy and carry on as if the buggy had been a passing seagull or a dog that cocked its leg rather than a bolt of lightning aimed at you by some malicious god. But would your visit be followed by a life of bliss in your apartment? Or would you pat my cheek in your usual charming way, then leave to join the waiting cab and the friends I'd never meet, the night breeze ruffling your shirt without seeing the buggy that will put an end to all of this, the parrots, jujubes, and the waving palms. Thank you, Leo. Um, thank you to Anthony for that brilliant and beautiful poem, and thank you everybody who is here. Um, so, the anthology will be going out into the world uh, tomorrow, which is very, very exciting. It's a beautiful, beautiful book, and I'm very, very proud of it. Um, please help. Uh, we are a small independent publishing company. You will know what that means. Um, we have um, no resources, <laughs> no budget, and just a lot of love for poetry and a will to make things happen. Uh, we certainly don't have a marketing department. Um, so if we could uh, rope in the 94 of you who are currently on this Zoom call to that task, I would massively appreciate it if you could go forth um, and spread the word. If you enjoy it, please tell people, um, gift it to people, send it to people, uh, talk about it, sing it from the rooftops, um, carry copies of it ostentatiously with you uh, on public transport, whatever you need to do um, to please get these 50 extraordinary poems out there into the world, we would really, really appreciate it. So um, should you have a glass to hand, um, I'd ask you to raise it in a moment to... Uh, the 2022 anthology um, and it heading out into the world. Here we go to the anthology. And uh, thank you very much once again to all the poets who are here tonight, all 50 of you um, uh, that are here. We are really, really grateful. Thank you to Rebecca Goss for her beautiful and careful and uh, um, judging. And thank you to Eva, Leon, Nicole, and Charlie for reading so beautifully for us tonight. Uh, thank you to um, Anthony and to Matt for your uh, winning poems, um, which will be trumpeting out into the world. Um, if you'd like a bit more live canon in your life, um, uh, please join us for other events coming up this week. We've got the next in the live canon lunchtime reading series. I think we're on reading number 38 on Friday. Um, uh, coming up on November the 7th, we have some work in progress a collaboration between the Ensemble and Glyn Maxwell called Corpse Lights, where we are reinventing some of those very male and patriarchal Victorian poems to be about contemporary politics. 
And um, uh, of course we have Cassandra running at the moment, which is the first English language uh, production of a very important iconic Ukrainian feminist play from 120 years ago, Cassandra by Lesia Ukrenka, which we've uh, collaborated on with the Ukrainian Institute. Um, so please do come and join us for any of those events or live stream them from wherever you might be. Um, but thank you so much for joining us tonight. I've had a completely glorious evening and I hope you have too. Um, and in a minute, we'll all do that Zoom thing where we wave goodbye to each other uh, across the gallery as, as faces disappear from screens. Um, uh, but thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. And I uh, look forward to everybody receiving their anthologies and uh, please do let us know um, if you're enjoying them and please do spread the word. Good night. <laughs>